Rick and Morty is actually a tragedy, and an incredibly dark one at that. While many of its installments are episodic, there's an underlying story that is nothing short of both horrific and emotionally impactful, and it all revolves around our two protagonists and the true nature of their lives. I was honestly surprised in the best way how deep the writing gets when you really look into it, and I'm not just using hyperbole to hype up the video. The overarching story of Rick and Morty goes to some genuinely dark and thought-provoking places, and we're about to investigate all of it. Obviously, the entirety of the show often runs off of dark humor, a device that many adult cartoons utilize to strike reactions in the audience. However, this isn't what I'm talking about, although the horror that can be found in many of the episodic stories could have an entire video in of itself. We're looking at you, Rick Potion, Vat of Acid, and That's Amorte. Heck, the entire concept of Mr. Meeseeks is just brutal, as well as Morty's Mind Blowers, which is basically just a collection of this stuff, and there's a nearly limitless amount of other examples across the episodes that are more or less self-contained. What this video is going to focus on is the larger narrative being told throughout the show, at times in the background and nuances, and at other times through episodes devoted entirely to the grander scheme. The best place to start is the main cast of characters, and as anyone familiar with the show is well aware, that means the Smith family, and of course, Rick Sanchez. The dynamic here is Rick being the father of Beth, who is married to Jerry, the two of them being the parents of Summer and Morty. For a good while, Beth's mother is pointedly absent from the show and rarely mentioned, but we'll get to all that rabbit hole later. Stories are driven by their characters, so to best understand why the story of Rick and Morty is so compelling, it is necessary to understand the inner workings of its main characters. We obviously have Rick, and we'll get into the specifics of his complicated psyche over the course of the video, but from the start we can see that he's a super genius alcoholic old man with a rather dark outlook on reality. He displays many sociopathic traits and has a general vibe of everything and everyone will die one day, and that nothing really matters because the universe is so big. His technological capabilities knows no bounds, and he seemingly does stuff just for the sake of pleasure or experience. His daughter Beth has a pretty fiery spirit despite some lasting trauma from when Rick abandoned her for a long stretch of time years ago, and generally places herself as the authoritative rule over the household given that her husband is much weaker willed than she is. She keeps Rick around due to the fact that she missed having a father for so long, and she lets him get away with so many outlandish antics due to the fact that she's afraid he'll abandon her again. Opposite to her is her husband Jerry, who is different in every way. He is timid and submissive and has next to no fighting instinct even when it comes to protecting his family at times. Together they have two children, Summer who is around 17 years old, and Morty who is around 14 years old. Summer is oftentimes depicted as her stereotypical teenage girl, concerned with popularity and possessing a certain attitude that she knows better than most of the people around her. She isn't quite a popular girl, but isn't usually an outcast either, although her immediate family enjoys giving her crap from time to time. Finally, we have the other namesake of the show, Morty. He's characterized as being generally dumb and forgiving to a fault, which a person kinda has to be in order to constantly put up with Rick and his absurd adventures. One thing that becomes exceedingly clear in the show is this family is often dysfunctional. See, Jerry more or less accidentally got Beth pregnant with Summer towards the end of their high school years. Rick expresses his belief that because of this, Beth felt pressured to be with Jerry rather than genuinely selecting him as her soulmate. Due to this, and the combination of Jerry's stark contrast to Rick's personality, there is a vast rift between Beth's husband and her father, which causes household issues on the regular. Furthermore, even without the inserted drama by Rick's presence in the family, marital problems can be observed between Beth and Jerry in day-to-day -day scenarios. Their marriage is usually held together on a thread, something that is felt by Morty most, who expresses his concerns about his parents getting a divorce. The dynamic between Rick and Morty shifts and changes depending on their feelings towards each other. There are many deserved examples where Morty gets rightfully angry with Rick and they have a falling out. Honestly, the closest thing to a will-they-won't-they they that the show has is the camaraderie between Rick and Morty themselves and if their relationship will persevere through Rick's constant drunkenness and insanity. So this is the Smith family, the main cast of characters for the show. The nuances of the family dynamic are always changing and growing over the course of the show, with Beth and Jerry going on an arc where they do get divorced and eventually back together. 
Rick and Morty having several falling outs, and Beth even gets cloned at one point, which effectively adds a new member to the family, something we'll talk about a little bit more later on. Obviously the main driving force behind the lore of the show is Rick Sanchez, and the truth surrounding his past is what delves into the darker depths of the storyline. It is clear right away that Beth's mother, and his wife, is pointedly absent from the show. Mentions to her are scarce, and narratively, one begins to suspect a grander story being hinted at. What is obvious is that Rick's perception of love is quite negative. Take this line he speaks in mid-season 1, during an episode that is entirely shaped around Morty chasing love from his school crush, Jessica. I hate to break it to ya, but what people call love is just a chemical reaction that compels animals to breed. On the one hand, this could be Rick being his typical, insensitive scientist self, expressing the concept of love in a bare-bones physiological sense. But given the fact that he has a daughter that he does display affection towards, one can't help but think Rick is speaking through a traumatized lens. That perhaps he once had a true experience with love, but is hardened in the wake of its absence. On this topic, there is a related trait of Rick that is important to discuss. By all means, he is a sociopath. He shows a complete disregard for life, whether it be human or alien, and won't even flinch when people die for completely trivial reasons that result entirely from his doing. However, in between the constant barrage of insults he berates them with, he does show a level of care for his family. As previously discussed, there is an affection for Beth present in his persona, and even in the earliest seasons he goes out of his way to help out Morty in multiple scenarios. In the very first episode, he straight up murders someone bullying Morty at school, and sure, Rick doesn't give much of a crap about anyone disconnected from his inner circle, but you can't help but think such an immediate violent response was triggered due to the bully's aggression towards Morty. Another similar example is when Rick specifically goes out of his way and briefly returns to a place they just escaped, only to kill a being that assaulted Morty. These two actions make it clear from the beginning, you don't mess with Morty, which is a precedent that remains somewhat consistent throughout the show. Now, this is a theme that will become more evident and further elaborated upon as we progress further through the show and the character developments, but due to a major event that happens early on, now would be a good time to discuss what I believe dictates the level of emotional attachment Rick has to a person. See, Rick's lack of care for the loss of any given thing largely comes from the fact that he has access to the infinite multiverse, which allows virtually anything to be replaceable. Anything lost can be regained, any consequence can be undone simply by hopping to another reality. However, what cannot be so easily replaced is specific experience between individuals. While Rick certainly can, and has, journey to realities where the dynamic with the family is so similar to the previous reality that any difference is indistinguishable, when people get harder to replace is when they accompany Rick on his multiversal travels. Finding a family that has the same bonding experiences that have been created through the several absurd adventures he had across multiple realities with the family, even in the infinite multiverse, would be a significant task. Furthermore, there's something to be said about forming an attachment to someone through shared experiences that, even if an identical replica was found, can't quite be replaced in the mind. And while this is jumping forward in the timeline, this type of philosophy can be seen in Rick when he eventually clones Beth. He specifically ensures that he does not know which is the clone and which is the original. What other purpose would this be than to ensure that he cares about each of them equally? After all, at the time of cloning, they would have been the same. As most people could probably sympathize with, Rick was uncertain that he'd be able to think of the clone as the same way he could think of the original, and to bypass this problem, he ensured that he wouldn't have the knowledge as to which was which. This same idea can be applied to universal variants. Even if Rick could find a Morty that had a nearly identical relationship with him, in his mind, he would always know that he isn't truly the Morty he went on all those prior adventures with, a line of thinking that lends itself to the reasons why Rick has formed an emotional attachment with this Morty specifically. With that being said, we can keep this in mind when we see Rick escape the first universe we see in the show, as his Earth is essentially ruined. He helps Morty get out of there along with him, but leaves behind the rest of the Smith family, pretty conscience-free I might add, while Morty is understandably haunted from the experience. They slip into the lost lives of their counterparts in the new universe, and can get settled in easily with the family as they are virtually identical to the old one. That being said, Morty's family who was left behind now gets to live through the apocalypse every day. Just because Rick leaves behind consequences doesn't mean they don't still happen. This scenario further establishes the idea that Rick's care is bound to shared experience. At this point, he has spent much more time bonding with Morty through their sci-fi adventures than he has with the rest of his introductory iteration of the Smith family, who, as any fans of the show know, aren't even his original family to begin with. Another moment that displays Rick's hidden genuine affection for Morty comes in an episode that serves as the first exposure to the location called the Citadel, a collection of Ricks who, seeking refuge from the different governments that were after them, ironically ended up forming their own government entirely constructed of Ricks. Here it is revealed that each Rick has a detectable brainwave due to their unnatural genius. 
and in order to make themselves undetectable, they need Mortys nearby them, due to Mortys having the opposite brain waves that sort of counter or mask the Rick waves. It's clear that many Ricks are just using their Mortys as a shield, viewing them more as a protective asset than a valued partner. However, while our Rick, who is labeled as C-137, is getting his brain forcibly downloaded, we see him tear up over memories of Morty, a rare display of true tender emotion. Furthermore, he bothers to comfort Morty after the boy expresses his concerns over the fact that so many pairs of Ricks and Mortys might devalue their relationship or existence as a whole. To this, Rick responds with the bold statement that he is the Rickest Rick, and that it would only make sense that the Rickest Rick would have the Mortyest Morty, a sentiment that does succeed in making Morty feel special. This self-declared Rickest Rick label was created in response to Morty accusing Rick of being unable to connect with people, which starkly displays what usually characterizes a Rick as a Rick, emotionally lacking to the extent of being sociopathic. However, given all the examples we've discussed so far, it is clear that our Rick, C-137, can and does care even if he refuses to show it in most scenarios. This is reinforced by the finale of Season 1. Throughout the show so far, Rick has occasionally used the phrase Wubba Lubba Dub Dub, which is revealed to have an actual meaning that recontextualizes it entirely. It is a phrase from bird person's language that is used to express deep emptiness and pain, and is used as a sort of cry for help. Bird person then goes on to say that Rick is constantly chasing different stimulations and highs due to the fact that he is trying to numb himself from the deep pain within him. This is one of the first times the series explicitly calls out Rick's inner turmoil that really drives the character. But what exactly is this inner turmoil? Up to this point, one could easily suspect that it has something to do with his absent wife named Diane, and that guess is further solidified by Rick's behavior surrounding Bird Person's wedding. He says things like, weddings are basically funerals with cake, and regarding marriage, I couldn't make it work, and I could turn a black hole into a sun. What are the bets that this is all a lie we tell ourselves because we're afraid to die alone? Because that's how we all die, alone. Once again, we see Rick being sensitive around romantic subjects and essentially trying to ruin the concept for others. When the wedding goes completely awry, we also see Rick get very distressed when Bird Person gets shot, showing that he does indeed feel emotion when certain people die if they have a connection as previously discussed, and Bird Person, like Morty, is an example of someone who has traveled the universe with Rick. At the end of this episode, we also get to see a rather noble decision of Rick. He sacrifices his own freedom for the good of the family of which he has a photo on his person I'll point out, which then directly leads to the next episode where we get the first good look at Rick's past. Now, the exact nature of Rick's history is revealed throughout the show, so I'm not going to go episode to episode pointing out the different references and hints, but rather just compile the timeline in this section. What is important to note about the first episode we really get a good context for his past is that he vehemently denies the validity of it and that it's just a fake backstory. Furthermore, after defeating a galactic empire, destroying the Rick Citadel, and helping the family and freeing Earth, Rick sabotages all of this by telling Morty all the ways everything he did could be considered as selfish, and most memorably, that he's only in it for a limited edition McDonald's sauce, and that's his driving motivation. This behavior very obviously displays that he's avoiding acknowledging the true horrors of his past by selling it as fake and masking his true desires. But what is most interesting is the pattern of relationship sabotage whenever he could get close to connecting with someone, a theme we'll get back to later. For now, it's finally time to delve into Rick Sanchez's past and see exactly what makes this show so tragic. If you're watching this video, that probably means you're interested in storylines, and one of the best ways to consume stories is through reading books. For the past six years, I've been writing and self-publishing novels to Amazon, which can be read in both digital and paperback form. Overall, I write in the science fiction genre, but each book has a slightly different nuance that will appeal to people invested in other genres as well. Do you enjoy high concept sci-fi? Linear Highway and Genesis Prince of Time should hit the spot. More of a spiritual horror fan? Cult of Shadows has a soul-shaking story to get lost in. Or perhaps you're into more of a mystery, better yet, a mystery that prompts you to put the pieces together and solve the narrative for yourself. In that case, Frameless Mirror should be perfect. If you enjoy stories and reading, please check out my author's page on Amazon and find the book that appeals to you, or perhaps even delve into the entire Lloyd Salt series. A huge thanks to anyone who considers this, links are in the description, and now back to the video. Originally, Rick C-137 was very much a family man. He was in love with his wife Diane and cared for his young daughter Beth. However, his scientific pursuits were taking time away from his family, and after a string of failures at portal travel, he was considering giving up the whole science thing as a whole. One day, while working in his garage, a version of himself from a different universe appeared, the person that would go on to be known as Rick Prime. Prime offered him access to the infinite multiverse, something that could effectively make him godlike, hanging out with endless versions of himself. Rick C-137 passed on this offer, though, clearly desiring to stay back with his family. 
Prime's response to this is a bit disbelieving, as he claims that Ricks don't pass on this, to which C-137 says, I'm a different kind of Rick, I guess. This line serves as a fantastic irony. C-137, throughout the early show, was parading himself as the Rickest Rick, a title that encompasses a character that only cares about science and displays a lack of love or emotion towards those around him. But in reality, when it all began, C-137 was in fact the least Rick. The reasons behind his shift in persona is nothing short of heartbreaking. In retaliation of C-137's refusal and love for his family, Prime murdered Diane and little Beth right in front of him with a bomb that he dropped into his own garage. This devastated Rick, and he regressed into a deep depression, until he was fueled by a burning desire for revenge, and used that motivation to discover the key to interdimensional travel for himself. He later describes this event as, That's the three lines of math that separated my life as a man from my life as an unfeeling ghost. As Rick traveled the multiverse searching for his family's killer, he came to a horrifying discovery. Diane isn't just dead in his universe, she is dead in every single one. Prime used something called the Omega device to erase Diane from infinity, effectively killing every iteration of her to exist, stripping every Rick everywhere from their wife, which is why so many of them are unfeeling ghosts. Obviously in real life, we can't travel to different universes, so when we lose a loved one, they are just as gone as if they had been Omega deviced. But Rick's loss is a special one for one main reason. He can replace absolutely anything and anyone with his access to infinity, except the one person that he loved the most. Anything he ever wants is at his fingertips, except the thing that matters the most to him. With this realization, there is only one motivation left for him. Kill Rick Prime. Except, Prime is incredibly smart and crafty and good at hiding. He's incredibly hard to find. So C-137 just starts killing any version of himself he can find, then scanning them to see if they were Prime. He does this for who knows how long, murdering probably thousands of versions of himself over the years, but never being able to find Rick Prime. Eventually he grows tired of all the multiversal killing of himself, and effectively starts the citadel he would later come to hate and even destroy. All this wraps into a line that Morty once said, Ricks hate themselves the most. Feeling as though he belongs nowhere and that nothing matters, Rick makes one last ditch effort. He travels to Prime's original universe, the one that he abandoned long ago, and lives there in hopes that he might return one day. He reunites with Prime's family, Beth, Summer, and Morty. The Morty that Rick has been going on adventures with this whole time, the one that we've been proving Rick has a special emotional attachment to, is in reality the grandson of the person that murdered Rick's family and erased his wife from infinity. It gives a completely new horrifying context to the entire show. That first family he was with was actually Prime's family that he had slipped into. Morty was actually related to Prime this entire time. And even though in the wake of his great suffering Rick has become an alcoholic and a high-chasing sociopath, he has still managed to forge a bond with a grandson that isn't really his, and is in fact family with a version of himself he hates the most. Despite years having gone by, Rick has never really given up the hope that he could exact revenge on Rick Prime, and this becomes a big plot point as the show goes on. To explain how he finally makes progress on his decades-long and multiversal spanning quest for revenge, we must now shift our attention to the other overarching story embedded into the show, one that is equally as dark, the lore behind the character known as Evil Morty. Evil Morty is a driving force behind many of the plots surrounding the Citadel. He's revealed to be the true puppet master behind the Rick that was hunting down and killing Ricks along with downloading their brains, and he even managed to become president of the fallen Citadel in the wake of its destruction at the hands of C-137. Evil Morty's backstory is rather simple. He's just a Morty that finally had enough of his Rick. One night, after his Rick got drunk out of his mind, he took over his body and controlled it remotely through his eye patch, then went on a quest across the multiverse to kill a bunch of Ricks and download their brains, essentially accumulating the genius of multiple Ricks. Furthermore, to hide himself and cloak his operation, he would steal their Mortys and create a Morty dome around his base, putting them in constant pain so as to better hide himself from the Ricks that might be searching for him. Evil Morty is motivated by his hatred of how Ricks treat their Mortys, yet he is willing to sacrifice and torture Mortys for the sake of his end goal, that being to escape the central finite curve. The finite curve is the name given to the proverbial wall that the Ricks built around infinity, separating the infinite universes where Rick is the smartest man in the universe from the infinite multiverse where he isn't. Effectively, what this means as far as interdimensional travel goes, is that all the Mortys inside the curve are forever stuck with Ricks, and the interdimensional traveling Ricks are forever stuck with each other. Furthermore, as a part of ensuring they are protected from tracking due to the opposite brainwaves, the Ricks of the Citadel have begun cloning Mortys rather than finding universes where they exist organically, then going on to essentially groom them for submission and forgiveness to whatever Rick they get assigned to. 
Evil Morty refers to this as an infinite crib built around an infinite baby, an infinite smear of one crappy old man. In his monologue, he explains how Ricks view themselves as the underdogs, as they all believe they are the victims of each other. A perpetual cycle of hating oneself and hating the other versions of oneself, the catalyst for a lot of this all tracing back to the evil of Rick Prime, with Morty's caught in the middle, the very reason for their existence for a lot of them just to be a tool for Ricks. Evil Morty just wants to escape the curve, to be rid of Rick forever, and he doesn't care how many Ricks and enslaved Mortys he has to kill to do it. In the finale of season 5, he accomplishes his goal and does just that. However, the paths of C-137 and Evil Morty would cross again after the hunt for Rick Prime intensifies once again. As Evil Morty puts it, C-137 is basically fracking the curve, merging dimensions to consolidate the decoys of Prime in order to eventually find the real one and kill him. The interdimensional shockwaves from this can be felt even outside the curve, which enticed Evil Morty to come see what was happening and why. In flexing his superiority, Evil Morty helps C-137 in getting real close to finally finding Rick Prime which results in springing a trap that brings them all to a confined space where Prime has constructed a game for any Ricks that come close to finding him. Kill each other, and the last remaining Rick would get their Diane back. This is of course a lie, and after C-137 and his duo of Mortys comes out on top, they narrowly escape. The good news is they finally have the means of pinpointing Prime's location, and after C-137 immediately goes to finally find him, the two Mortys follow. Evil Morty's primary motivation is fear of the Omega device. He wants to be in control of it so that he knows nobody else is. A climactic battle ensues when Rick finally faces his nemesis after all these years, ending with C-137 nearly killed. Evil Morty is able to incapacitate Prime and revive C-137, even letting our Rick have the final face-off with his nemesis as he secures the Omega device. C-137 opts to beat Prime to death one punch at a time, as the villain gets in his last words. You're welcome by the way. I made you. I showed you infinity. And what did you do with it? Hang out with my grandson? Raise echoes of my daughter? What's your life without me? Admit it, you would have been me. I just walked into your garage before you walked into mine, but eventually you did. You lived in my house. After this, Arik emerges, covered in the blood of his enemy with an emotionless expression on his face. After all this time, he was finally triumphant, but he certainly doesn't look like the victory made any difference. How's it feel, Evil Morty asks. Better? No? Exactly the same? Yeah, it always does. I hope you're happy with your choice. Just because Rick Prime is dead doesn't mean Diane is back. Rick succeeded in killing his enemy, but the emptiness remains, and is maybe even amplified now that his purpose of hunting down Prime is over. His emotionless face as the next few scenes go by silently screams one thing. What now? Ever since his family was killed, one thing has been clear. Rick has struggled with moving on. He has been perpetually stuck in his pain, trying his best to numb it with alcohol and other substances, always distracting himself with wacky adventures and expressing his turmoil through being a jerk to those around him. He even made the automated voice in his car, based after his wife's, designed his house to haunt him in her absence. All of Rick's inner demons are brought to light in the most recent episode in the finale to season 7. For some reason, in a Denny's restaurant there's a hole known as the Fear Hole. Entering it will force you to face many of your fears, only letting you escape once you manage to conquer your greatest fear. All around, this is a really good episode, with fun thematic elements, a twist towards the end, and the idea that Morty's greatest fear is his reliance on Rick. However, what's really interesting about this episode is the look into Rick's fears that we get. The fear hole creates its own version of Diane, and we get to see Rick interact with her. He expresses how she's the only thing he can't replace, and also how terrible life has been without her. In regards to alcohol, he says that he was looking for his wife at the bottom of every bottle. One thing that becomes clear throughout the episode is that Rick's fear is a vastly complicated one. His greatest fear is of being happy. He understands better than anyone that all happiness is temporary. Furthermore, Rick has already lost his happiness once. He fears being happy again, because if he is, he risks losing it all again. This coincides with everything we've seen out of Rick throughout the show, and explains his constant sabotage of relationships with the family even after he's done something good for them. The big twist reveal of the episode is that the fear hole is completely centered around Morty, and that Rick was never really in it. When Morty somewhat carelessly mentions that Diane was in there, Rick runs back to the hole and we can see his temptation to jump in. But he doesn't. Instead. He turns to the board of people who escaped the hole, takes a photo of Morty out of his wallet, and proudly pins it on the board. The symbolism here is epic. Rick deciding against going the hole to see a facsimile of Diane and instead highlighting Morty's victory over the hole shows that Morty is slowly helping him move on from the pain of losing his original family. Morty didn't only succeed in conquering his own greatest fears in the hole, but is helping Rick overcome his greatest fear every day. It's beautifully poetic. Through the grandson of the man who took everything from him, 
Rick is learning to love and be happy again.